So, Steve, you're up. I'm just going to talk because... Uh, just go to yeah, okay, right. I'm just going to keep talking while I just hit this website. It's not actually totally essential. I'm just going to talk about um, something called DAT today. Has anyone heard of DAT? Not DAT, DAT. DAT, the tool DAT, everyone. Okay, so um, I got to hang out with the guys that wrote DAT on the weekend at Camp JS and learned a little bit about it. It's a very interesting little tool. It's uh, basically Git for data. So they're trying to do what a Git has done for code and code sharing for data. So um, it's a really cool bunch of guys. They're funded by a couple of foundations and also the uh, some organizations in the US mainly around open data and so basically you can where you'd normally have CSV files, docx files, some governments use docx would you believe for um, um, it doesn't matter um, at Wombat yeah Wombat 14 um, a lot of uh, people will use 14 I'm just gonna talk it doesn't matter um, yeah 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 <laughs> So a lot of uh, people will use CSV, DOCX, XLSX, XML, JSON, all sorts of formats like that for open data. Basically, you can slurp all of this stuff into that. Uh, it's all written in Node.js, so it's all kind of written with streaming in mind, streaming massive amounts of data. Uh, you can put it in even live modes where the data streams through. Uh, but it's great. Once you've got your data into DAT, you can go basically DAT clone a repo, and you can push and pull to all the things like you would do with Git, but for data as well. Uh, it's totally alpha at the moment, but they've actually got some funding, which is really great. And they're um, doing a lot of hacking on it, and they're encouraging people to use it. Uh, we did some good workshops on the weekend, basically ingesting the entire NPM repository, which uh, is pretty massive, and doing um, running code around finding the biggest module and things like that. And um, yeah, it's very cool. It's got uh, a RESTful API to it and also JavaScript bindings and some other bindings for the languages. Have a look at it. It's uh, dat-data.com and the team, uh, it's a really interesting team. One of the guys, uh, Max, Max, uh, he's apparently some J JS rock star he used to work with Code for America. So Lynn Fine, who's one of our keynotes this week, uh, knows him apparently. And it's working? Okay, well, I was just gonna. I just wanted to show you one page, basically. How many? How much time have I got, Jacinta? Okay, cool. I just. Woohoo! Cool. So this is the that page. Ah, and F11 doesn't do full screen. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's, yeah, F5. No, it doesn't matter. Totally doesn't matter. Anyway, so Max Ogden is the uh, lead, but I also got to hang out with Matthias and uh, also um, Bruno, and they were in a really cool workshop. Uh, if you go to the Getting Started Guide at the top, sorry, if you go to the Getting Started Guide, if you go to Docs, Getting Started Guide, there, you'll get a little idea for what the command line work looks like. Command line, don't let flash. <laughs> Why do you need flash for that? It's a GitHub thing. There you go. So there you go, you got it. Can everyone see that? If you want to create a DAT repository, you make a directory, do DAT in it, just like Git. You can push some data into it, some JSON data. Then you can have a look at it. You can import CSV. They've also got backends for other things. If you want to, um, by default, it has no primary keys. It's just flat. But you can add primary keys. You can attach blobs. Blobs are stored in a separate um, system to get performance. Uh, you can just start a web server by DAT listen. And then you can then give that to a mate, and he can go and clone off it. Um, and then you can pull data from other repos, push things. Um, it all runs on level DB behind the scenes, but you don't actually see any of the level DB stuff. So that's about all I've got to say. Um, check it out. Thanks. Okay, next up is Kalvinda, who's going to talk about heart rate mon monitoring. Thank you. Everyone calls me Cal, by the way, rather than or or Vinda. Sorry. Um, I think I just use the whiteboard. Oh, don't have my own strength. <laughs> No, nah, it's all right. So, have we started? I'm assuming we have. Um, 
Oh yeah, th by, by the way, this has nothing to do with the company I work for. This was something that I did um, about two years ago um, because I went off to the doctor um, because we had at our workplace a nurse come in and she told me that I had very high blood pressure and I should be dead. So I go, well, that doesn't sound right because I'm still alive. So I went off to the doctor and the doctor shook his head when I told him the story and said, no, you've got a very normal blood pressure, I'm very healthy and so on. And then, um, and then he took my heart rate and said, do you know that you've got a very irregular heartbeat? And I said, no. So then I had what was going to be a 10 minute little procedure, ended up being a two hour experience for me involving ECG monitoring and um, them discovering that I've got a fully compensated heartbeat. So my heartbeat goes like this. It goes, whoops, I'll do that again. It goes, whoops, like that. So on average, I have a constant heartbeat. But, <laughs> except for this bed here, you know. So on average it's all good, but it's still considered to be dangerous. It would have been really bad if this was like that. So I started paying more attention to my heart. So I started downloading apps. I got myself a watch which monitors my heart. And what I discovered was that a lot of developers don't realise that heartbeats can be like this and be still be quite normal. So then I went, okay, I need to create myself my very own app that measures my heartbeat because my heartbeat isn't the normal heartbeat that people have. I have, I wrote this app and I'll explain what, what I did, but let me just say I ran this app on other IT people and out of the 12 IT people, only one IT person had a normal heartbeat. So there must be something about this profession. <laughs> so I, um, I decided to do a little bit of research on how people measure heartbeats. And I didn't want to go with the ECG because I didn't want to be, be running an ECG monitor. So a no, another normal way of measuring, another really um, useful way of measuring heartbeats is to use the light intensity that goes through your finger. And what happens is that the, the amount of oxygen you have in your finger do, um, decides on how much light will go through it because the oxygen actually absorbs more light than, um, than, than less oxygen. So I used my um, camera on my smartphone and, the, and I got an Android phone of course and I was able to grab the raw um, um, video images of my, of, of my blood. Uh, of, of the light, sorry, of, I should say, the raw video images of, um, of the um, um, pictures from having my finger on the, on, on the camera. And um, from that, I was able to get my, my, my heart, heartbeat, and unlike what a lot, lot, lot of developers do, is where they see something like this, they go, oh, there must be something wrong, I'll just count that as one, and then go, you know, what the hell's happening here? And then, and then decide, uh -oh, I can't measure at all. I can now measure my heartbeat. I can give you the algorithm if anyone's in interested. How much more time have I got left? 17 seconds. And it was a lot of fun learning about how the heartbeat works and how blood and light work as well. So thank you very much for listening to that story. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have Nick Moore talking about Tranquil APIs. After Nick Moore, we have Richard Keach. And your time starts now. Yep. 
All right, this is one of those uh, projects that's a bit of a, a wild hair project. It's something that was annoying me while working on another project. So I gave it a name and now it's got slides. It's called Tranquil APIs. Um, basically the idea is it's a protocol framework, a bit like REST, but without a few of the things I found really, really annoying about REST while working with REST and OData and similar things. Amongst other things, it's transport agnostic so that you don't have all this involvement in HTTP. That means it works exactly the same way over web sockets as it does over HTTP, which is kind of nice if you're the kind of person who wants to choose one or the other fairly arbitrarily. It also allows multiple actions per request, which means that you don't have this many, many messages flying back and forth, nice in a mobile situation. Also very nice if you'd like it all to happen in one SQL transaction, which is something that's really hard to do in REST stuff. Um, actions are composable and um, that means that you can write the action once and use it in multiple places. Um, it's almost like having a real programming language to work with and they're extensible. It's very easy to add extra actions to the thing. And it doesn't stuff a whole bunch of random rubbish into URLs with lots of question marks and ampersands and things you forgot to escape and then you discover an ID isn't numeric, it's actually Unicode and then nothing works anymore. All right, so the general key concepts, there's a context which describes the use of resources, all users, all active users, all users who meet a, meet a particular filter, whatever. Um, actions which, can form, which transform a context into another context, so it's really a way of filtering and moving along your contexts, um, or into data that you'd like to have returned. So for example, if you've got a context representing all users, you would apply a filter action that would turn it into a particular subset of users. Um, you can then pipeline those actions together, like that top example there, which says basically take your, your user's context, filter it, now count it. So you're do, doing two separate actions, one after the other. Um, or you can run them in parallel, like that bottom example. And when you're running them in parallel, you give them names. You can build that into an arbitrarily big and complicated structure and this request is just a piece of JSON that you pass through in your request and you get JSON in response. Um, the nice thing about this as a way of getting a response is that you're giving them names in the request, you're getting the names back in the response which means for any JavaScript people you can just say response.authors.count which is actually kind of a nice feature if you'd like your code to be actually readable. Um, and because it's transport agnostic, you can define a transport in about three lines of definition. You say, well, just post it to some API endpoint, we'll pick it up, we'll do something with it, we'll give you the response. That's about all there is to it, really. Um, if you'd like to discuss this in detail, um, either Google it, Tranquil APIs, or have a look up at that URL, which is where I wrote a sort of blog post about it, or we're doing a um, Web APIs boff uh, this evening, so come along to that if you'd like to talk about Tranquil and or OData and or REST and or any of the other many, many kinds of Web API things that are out there. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have Richard Keach talking about Open Hub Config, an extension from his keynote earlier today. And then we'll be, he'll be followed by Andrew Berg. Yes, you'll need that. And your time starts now. No video. There we go. I don't have a mirrored screen, so I can't really see what I'm doing well. But anyway, um, this morning was a reasonably code-free zone in my talk, so I just wanted to give you a quick um, outline of how to add um, an item to my um, home monitoring system. Um, the key with OpenHab is that there, there, uh, there are a number of config files. Um, can I have someone hold the mic while I type? Thanks, Jacinta. I'm going to have to get down on my knees. Okay, can you see that all right? Okay, what we're going to try and do is 
uh, count the number of uh, devices on my home network. So if I do uh, look at that, the, the, the device is currently with an ARP entry. So if I, I d that's my script that I've just written. It's a no-brainer and it just tells me there are, excluding the host and the gateway, there are seven uh, entries on my home network. So if we go into this sitemap file, um, okay, this file defines the structure of the website that's presented from a mobile point of view. Um, and down here I've got a frame which defines the things that I want to put into my home mo uh, internet monitoring stuff. And I'll just add, a, add an item called text item equals IP devices, and that's, a, that's just an arbitrary string, uh, which corresponds to the name of an item in another file. So, okay, so that's been defined. So we go to this other one here. And this is the file that defines every possibly presented, captured information. So I'll define a new uh, item which is of type number and I'll call it IP devices which corresponds to the one I added before and I'll get there's a funny format which I can't I'm gonna have to make for this full screen how am I going for time okay So, uh, okay, so I, this is what's going to print out a number of devices and then a format string, percent D for it because it's a decimal and then I'll paste in what I got before. And so what's in this uh, braced element here is what's called a binding. And this particular binding is an exec binding, which means the item gets a value based on something just executed in the local operating system. And it's going to be the output of a command user local bin IP count dot sh. Yeah, Thank you. <coughs> okay, so that's it, and it automatically refines the stuff. So in the time remaining, if I just no, oh, where's my mouse cursor? It's on here. It's on here. And there we go. Yeah. Number of devices seven. Hold on. Okay. After Andrew's talk, we have um, Adam. And your time starts now. Sure. Thanks very much. Yeah. Hello, hello. Is it right? I didn't touch it. So my talk's around um, AWS auto scaling and some stories around that. I, I called it in the um, first bit AWS auto scaling zen or something, but what I wanted to do is just give you a couple of examples of some of the things we've done with it and some of the challenges we've found. Who's used AWS auto scaling at all? Okay, cool. Some people know what it is. All right. So starting off here, once we get once my text port here hopefully gets me coming up. Uh, so what is auto scaling? Uh, if we can just get to that first slide, hopefully maybe one day. 
Uh, okay, so auto scaling essentially is your ability to scale out horizontally the machines that you're using in the traditional way in which you'd have multiple front ends uh, sitting in front of one database server, for example, right? Now, this is actually a, a diagram of the path by which your pool of servers grows and shrinks, not so much a network diagram. So you've got on the left, you've got an auto scaling group, which would typically be uh, a number of front ends, let's say four front ends that are all running Apache and talking to a database. And then you'll have a scale out event generally some sort of load event, you'll fire up some more instances there to the right and then you, that instance gets included into the auto scale group. So you went from four to five, okay? So it might be from four to six, something like that. And the same thing happens when scaling down. So a scale down event, scale in event, and it gets removed and goes back to um, goes back to the number it was before. So in order to, to get it working, you have to define an auto scale group, okay? Uh, which is set up through the console using the APIs. This is an AWS. They're usually sitting behind an ELB, which is a load balancer. You then define some launch configurations. Essentially, this is choosing the AMI compute image, which is sort of a snapshot of a machine, right? So that would just be your, uh, in the web server context, that would be your web server with your application code ready to, go, ready to go, already configured to talk to your database and, you know, maybe your clustered file system. And then you define scaling plans, which is the rules around how you will launch these new compute instances. So the challenges are, put briefly, and this, you, know, you could spend the whole day talking about this sort of stuff, uh, it's not a magic wand that allows you to just always under-provision and then suddenly up the capacity when you need to. That's what we thought at first, and it just isn't that way. Um, launching new compute nodes around an event, uh, a load event is not always as snappy as you would like to be. You don't just click your fingers and they appear. Uh, load spikes can still cause your stack to fall over. Even if you have auto scaling in place, it doesn't mean that you will just be able to tolerate any kind of load. No matter which rules you write or, or how, how, how well tuned things are, you can still drown your capabilities while things are spinning up. Defining scaling rules is not always intuitive or easy. Just because you can write rules around how you're going to have, you know, how you're going to spawn new instances, it doesn't actually, you're not quite sure when you should spawn new instances. Like, should the, should the load average be 40% or 50%? And how many minutes should it be like that before you start uh, spawning these instances? Because actually, if you get it wrong, what you end up with is lots of things coming in and out of the autoscale group, which has its own challenges and potential risks, because these, these compute nodes don't always actually come completely ready to go. They might come with a cold cache, and they need to sort of, they need to be running for a while before they're fully useful. So getting it right is a bit of a journey. The other one to bear in mind is that compute node doesn't always boot up ready to go. Uh, there might be things that need to happen on the server for it to be useful, such as a cache being warmed. Uh, you can't auto scale everything. Uh, RDS, it doesn't work like that. But with sort of immutable front end machines, you can get a lot of mileage out of it. One more desire, one more thing that we spend quite a lot of time uh, wrestling is that monitoring of the compute nodes within an, e within an auto scale group is a little bit new and wacky. Uh, traditionally with Nagios, you sort of give machines a name and you sort of monitor them and you care about them and if they go away you react. Whereas in an auto scale group there might be four machines or there might be ten machines, compute nodes, and you don't really know and in the, in the instance of machines coming in and out of the auto scale group they will actually be broken. So there are some challenges around m mapping a traditional monitoring uh, methodology to this world so that you do actually notice when things like Apache on one of these machines is broken. Uh, Opsworks, which is in the space, how much time have I got left? Uh, Opsworks, Opsworks is like orchestration, be careful of Opsworks, can be tricky. More cool stuff, using Autoscale Group to run, process a queue, that is super cool. We haven't done it yet, but it's a great, great application and surely there's no time for questions at the end of that. <laughs> Well, what I'm going to talk about is um, a platform for uh, searching across 30 and growing um, Australian uh, humani humanities um, cultural data sets. So we worked on this under the leadership of Deakin with over a dozen um, 
cultural organisations across the country and uh, universities, and which you can sort of see if I can scroll, um, on the wonderful honey.net.au website, which was launched by the Vice Chancellor of Deakin a couple of weeks ago. Um, and why I'm talking about it here in an open source um, forum is that it's built with an enormous grab bag of open source technologies. Um, it's open source itself. And most of the data is available um, on the, the source platforms and within the Honey platform itself at, uh, under a license that's open. Um, and in addition to that, um, you can all contribute to this platform, which is designed for both searching and linking together the cultural um, data sources that have been mined by the Honey tool. So in the middle, we've got Dame Edna Everidge, who's probably represented in multiple data sets across the country. And all of these links have been contributed by people who've come along and found the individual records harvested across the, across the um, different data sets and said, oh, that's really interesting. Um, that's actually Barry Humphreys, who has some interesting koalas and girl guides. I don't even want to go there. Um, this is a growing uh, set of linkages between these data sets, um, which you can all contribute to. And so I'd encourage you to go to honey.net.au and also pa partake in the Six Degrees of Honey competition, where you indeed can go to Dame Edna Everidge and come up with your own interesting ways to link her, him, to various cultural uh, information across Australia's cultural landscape. Thank you. Output. Yep. Oh, yeah. yes. yes. Hooray. Well, that's a gonna... <laughs> yeah, I'm not that's gonna fine, no, no. I'm not gonna tempt fate. No, no. no. <laughs> okay. It's working, we're good. <laughs> um, excellent. Okay. Thanks. Uh, theorems for free. Okay, so reasoning about programs. Um, all of these things make reasoning about programs more difficult. Null values, type casing, aka instance of operators, um, type casting, side effects, uh, exceptions, and general recursion, which is recursion that um, can, can potentially go on forever. Non-substructural recursive uh, recursion. Total languages do not have any of these. Um, in a total language, every program terminates nicely. However, most programmers are using non-total languages. Um, even Haskell has exceptions and general recursion. But there are total languages. Uh, some of these include Idris, Koch, and Agda. Fast and loose reasoning is the idea that you should reason about programs written in non-total languages as if they were written in a total language. This idea is justified mathematically by Danielson et al. in a 2006 paper called Fast and Loose Reasoning is Morally Correct. <laughs> so, what does fast and loose reasoning cost you? Well, nothing. It turns out any program at all can be written without using any of those things on the previous slide. And by avoiding these escape hatches, or as I prefer to call them, trap doors, um, you gain a lot in terms of composability of programs and the ability to reason about the behaviour of those programs. Parametric polymorphism. So consider these two function signatures. Um, just take a straw poll. Who thinks uh, the first one is better? No? You all agree that... No? Some, some people do. Um, the second? Who's not sure? Okay, plenty of hands there. Um, so which one gives the programmer more information? The first one? Okay. Um, and which is better? I, I just asked that one. Okay. Um, those people who thought the first one gave the programmer more information are wrong. Um, where type variables are used, so on the, on the previous slide where there was the, uh, 
um, list of A and list of A. Um, those are universally quantified type variables. Um, the implementer of a function with a type signature containing universally quantified type variables cannot use any functions specific to any type in relation to those inputs to the function. Therefore, you're forced to ignore irrelevant things and you're going to get to a correct implementation faster. Uh, furthermore, the user of those functions has a guarantee that those functions are going to work for any type that they choose whatsoever. But are there other benefits besides these to this kind of polymorphism? Yes, there are. Theorems for free. So in a paper in 1989, Phil Wadler wrote, write down the definition of a polymorphic function on a piece of paper. Tell me its type, but be careful not to let me see the function's definition. And I will tell you a theorem that the function satisfies. So useful theorems can be derived from polymorphic types. And a type is a partial, or indeed sometimes a complete, specification of the behaviour of a function, and not just the type of what goes into the function and what comes out. Um, this result is called parametricity. So, parametricity will do just one example. Consider this function. Its type signature should hopefully look familiar to you. It's what we saw a few slides back. So, what does this function do? Does it reverse the list? Well. A function with this type could reverse a list, um, or it could return an empty list. You don't know exactly what this function does, but you do know this. Every element in the output appears in the input. As long as you're using a total language or applying fast and loose reasoning and also adhering, it in terms of how, adhering to it in terms of how you implement the function, um, then this must be true. No one had to tell you that. It's in the types. So embrace types, types of documentation, and that's the end.